Welcome to a very normal therapeutics employee training video. In this video, we're covering the one-way analysis of variance, also known as the one-way ANOVA. If you're a new employee of this made-up pharma company, then welcome. My name is Christian, and I'm your fictional manager who will be guiding you through this lesson. I'm currently a PhD candidate in biostatistics, and I've made it my goal to make you better at statistics. This series of training videos are designed to help our employees fortify their knowledge of basic statistical tasks. Knowledge and concepts used in this video may rely on concepts used in past training videos, so keep that in mind. As a statistician of this company, you'll be expected to offer statistical advice to some of our other researchers. You never know what kinds of ideas or questions you might encounter, so you have to be ready for anything. To prepare you for this, we'll work through a mock statistical consultation. I'll give you a problem, let you think about it for a few seconds, and then give you a possible approach to it. Here's the problem. As a pharma company, we develop new medicines. Recently, we developed a new cancer drug that targets a specific mutation that actually appears in a few different cancers. In this case, there are five types of cancers our drug can target. Theoretically, the drug should work in all of them, but of course, treating cancer is complicated. Before we move on to a large randomized controlled trial, we want to figure out if our new cancer drug works better in at least one of these cancers. If it does, then this cancer drug pair would have a good shot of succeeding in a larger trial. The outcome we're interested in is reduction in tumor size, which you can assume to be a continuous variable. If one of the five cancers show a higher than average decrease in tumor size, then that's exactly what we're looking for. But if none of them show a noticeable decrease, then we can ditch this drug sooner than later and move on to something more promising. Based on all of this information, how would you suggest we approach the analysis? One of the key elements of this problem is that there are multiple groups, specifically more than two. When there are just two groups, we can do a comparison between them, but it's not that simple when there are five of them. The goal of the experiment is to identify a group who seems like they might really benefit from the drug. If there is a group like that, then the distribution of their tumor shrinkages should look smaller than the other groups. There's a hypothesis test that's suited to multiple groups, and if the title of the video didn't already give it away, it's called the One-Way Analysis of Variance. For short, I'll just call it the ANOVA. Since it's a hypothesis test, We'll think about it in terms of the NHST, the Null Hypothesis Significance Testing Framework. We'll look at the assumptions of the test, the parameters of interest, the Null Hypothesis, the test statistic, and the Null Distribution of the statistic. All hypothesis tests have assumptions, and the ANOVA is no different. In our example, we're dealing with the change in tumor size, a continuous outcome. Each of the five groups are thought to have their own average change in tumor size, thanks to the drug. For a specific group, the amount that each person differs from their group average is assumed to be normally distributed. Note that this is not the same as assuming that the outcome itself is normally distributed. It's the so-called residuals that are normally distributed. We also need to assume that the residual variances in all the groups are the same. The fancy word for this is homoscedasticity, but visually speaking, it just means that the spread of each group's residuals are all the same. Finally, we need to assume that we have independent observations within each group. One person's change in tumor size cannot influence the change in another person. The parameter of interest here are the group means. Since these distributions represent change in tumor size, we're hoping to see that one of these groups has a significant negative group mean. To create a null hypothesis, we have to think about it in opposite terms. If none of these groups have a different mean than the others, then they all must also have the same mean so this forms our null hypothesis. If this is the null hypothesis, then what do you think the alternative hypothesis is? It's tempting to think that the alternative is that one of the group means is some specific value, but that's not the case here. For the null hypothesis to be true, all of these equal signs have to be true. So the alternative hypothesis is that at least one of the group means is different. Note that the alternative hypothesis doesn't tell us which of the group means is different, just that at least one of them is. Next up is the test statistic. Even though we're interested in the means of the groups, they aren't what we look at when we do an ANOVA. Remember that ANOVA stands for Analysis of Variance. So instead, we're dealing with the variances in the data. 
This can be really confusing at first, so we'll try to develop an intuition on why this is the case. Rather than show you the test statistic immediately, I'll start with an important theorem in probability called the Law of Total Variance, which is given by this equation. In our case, y is the outcome, while x represents the cancer group that someone is in. The first thing to notice is that on one side, we have the marginal variance of the outcome, but on the other side, we're dealing with both conditional variances and conditional expectations. The law of total variance says that the total variance in the outcome can be broken into two parts, the average of all the group variances and the variance in the group averages. We'll look at both of these terms and apply them to our specific problem. This inner term here represents each of the group means. To make it easier to read, I'll replace this expectation with my notation earlier, these mu's with the group specific index. Depending on what hypothesis is true, this entire variance term can have a different value, so we'll get back to this in a bit. This term here represents the group variances. In the general case, all of the group variances can be different, but in this case we made an assumption. We assumed that all of the group variances were the same. This means that this inner variance is just a single number. And since it's the same in all the groups, it's not random, so we don't need an expectation. What we're left in this term is a shared group variance, sigma squared. And for all intents and purposes, this is just a number that doesn't change. But what can change is the second term. So this is the connection between our parameters of interest and the use of variance in this test. Let's say that the null hypothesis is true. Then all of the group means will be the same thing. We would expect to see that all of the data be clustered around this single mean. But if all of the group means are the same, then there's no variance between them. Because of this, the second term is zero when the null hypothesis is true, and what we're left with is just sigma squared. Another way to think about this is that all of the variances in the outcome just come from the randomness in the data. But now let's rewind a bit and assume that the alternative hypothesis is true. To make it simple, we're going to see what happens when just one of the groups truly benefits from the treatment. The medicine will help decrease tumor size more, so this pushes this group's mean lower than the others. You can see that the variance in the outcome gets greater just because the group mean gets shifted to the left. As soon as one of the group means becomes different from the others, then the second term becomes greater than zero. Under the null hypothesis, all the data will cluster around the shared group mean, and this forms one extreme. At the other extreme, all of the groups have distinct means. In this case, we'll see that the variance of the outcome will be much larger overall. Sometimes you hear this phrase as variance explained, which refers to how the different locations of the group means cause the outcomes to be more spread apart. So under the alternative hypothesis, the total variance has two terms. One is the variance in the data, and the other is the variance of the group means. The second term is what helps us distinguish between the null and the alternative hypotheses. So the higher it is, the more likely it is that the null hypothesis is incorrect. So how should we take advantage of this fact when we create a test statistic? Instead of checking this group-wise variance alone, we take the ratio of the group mean variance against the variance of the data. In textbooks, you might hear this phrase as explained variance over unexplained variance or variance between treatments over variance within a treatment. In essence, we're comparing the two terms that come out of the law of total variance. This is also known as the F statistic, named after Ronald Fisher. Because of this, we say that the ANOVA uses an F test to test for statistical significance. The last part of any hypothesis test is to figure out what distribution the test statistic comes from. Looking at the F statistic, we have a ratio of two variances. We can estimate both of these variances with the following equations. Thanks to the assumptions we made for the ANOVA, we can show that this statistic is a chi-squared distribution with j minus 1 degrees of freedom, where j is the number of groups in the data. And this statistic is another chi-squared distribution with n minus j degrees of freedom, or two chi-squared distributions that are both divided by their respective degrees of freedom. This particular statistic has been studied so much that we've given it its own name, the F distribution. It has a known probability density function, which means we can do what we've done with past hypothesis tests. We calculate the F statistic and compare it to the appropriate null F distribution. If the F statistic is large enough, then we reject the null hypothesis. Now that we know what the ANOVA is, 
let's see how to implement it in code. The first thing we need to do is organize our data in a data frame. One column should contain the outcome, and a second column should identify what group an observation belongs to. And I'm purposefully simulating it so that one of the groups has a smaller mean than the others. The function that implements ANOVA is also called ANOVA. First, we need to create a linear regression model. An ANOVA is actually a special form of a linear regression. For convenience, we'll store the model in its own variable. Next, all we need to do is provide the model to the ANOVA function, and the analysis will be run for us. This term is the variance in the group means, while this term is the variance in the data. The value for the F statistic can be found here. R automatically provides the P value for the test statistic right next to it, under this notation here. We can see that the P value is really small, so we would reject the null hypothesis at a 5% significance level. This makes sense given that one of the group means was simulated to be different from the others. ANOVA builds naturally on what I've covered before. We started with a one sample t test, moved to the two sample t test, and now we've come to the ANOVA, which lets us do a hypothesis test for three or more groups. It's a common hypothesis test that company employees should know, and I hope that you're better equipped to use it. If you like this video and want to stay updated with the channel, then consider subscribing. If you want my stuff sent directly to your inbox, then I hope you also sign up for my newsletter. You'll get a link to these new videos straight in your inbox, and you'll get a deeper look at what I'm cooking up in between my videos. Like always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.